All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Erin Maney, and I serve as the Manager of Community Engagement and Communications for the State University System of New York in partnership with SUNY's FAC2 Task Group on Open Pedagogy and our Conference on Instructional Technology. I would like to welcome you to this Open Education Week webinar. And we appreciate you starting your morning with us. If you could please type in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to get a sense of our audience and who you are and where you are. Perfect. Today we're pleased to host Dr. Marcia Burrell from SUNY Oswego. Dr. Burrell joined the Curriculum and Instruction Department in 2000 and has taught courses in assessment, math methods, and foundations. She works to include instructional technology into all the courses she teaches. Dr. Burrell's interests lie in using technology in the classroom, especially as a vehicle for the knowing and learning of mathematics. Dr. Burrell also enjoys assisting students in the process of learning about other cultures through travel courses. So on behalf of the SUNY Community of Practice, thank you for joining us today and sharing what you know about open pedagogy. I will turn this over to Dr. Burrell. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here. I, I didn't remember giving my, um, my biography, so that's good. <laughs> so now you know a little bit about me. I'm not using PowerPoint. I am sharing my screen and I'm having trouble getting it where I need it to be, so, but that's fine. Um, so yes, I've been at Oswego and I use this introduction about access to students being a privilege because students actually have choices and they come to our institution with aspirations and um, youthful approaches and their passion about why they came to the institution. So I always think about every opportunity with them is an opportunity for me to get to know them a little bit better and to really trust them um, to know what's best for, to know what's best. And so um, you know a little bit about me. I'm gonna talk about access to students and open pedagogy, and then I'll share some very specific examples. I wanna thank the Center for Teaching and Learning with uh, John Kane and Rebecca Mushter. Um, You've probably heard about their T for Teaching, but they have some really innovative ways of getting faculty to um, think about what they're doing at the institution and how to improve their teaching and their, um, you know, their approach to students. I've been in education for more than 35 years, and I often wonder, um, is what I'm doing relevant? And I find that if I integrate um, student perspectives into what I'm doing, then it makes uh, my life easier, but it also makes it more relevant for the student. Um, at SUNY Oswego, um, our library is heavily involved in OER, and um, there's a website. I'm sort of afraid to click on it because I don't know if I'll come back, but the website provides access for faculty to get grants as well as to um, get assistance on um, OER. Uh, we kind of have to define OER. Um, I like to look at it in terms of open educational practices. And this is a definition from, from Haggerty. Um, open tools and processes that promote collaboration and sharing of information, connected communication and learning and teaching collectively to grow knowledge um, and resources. And you know about the reducing of the cost of textbooks and having access to materials the very first day of class. Um, I come to open pedagogy um, from my background, um, you know, from my education, Carl Rogers on freedom to learn. And that really is about how we, uh, get students to trust themselves and then we provide the structure for them to gain access to what we want them to, to gain access to. So I pulled two quotes. It seems to me that anything that can be taught to another is relatively inconsequential and has little or no significant influence on behavior. Hmm. When I look back at the results of my past teaching, the real results seem the same, either damage was done or nothing significant occurred. 
Hmm. So I bring that to say that, yes, we have a perspective, we have expertise, but if students are not engaged in partially teaching themselves and gaining from the structure that we create, then we might be passing things on that damage them. And we have to really think about every uh, detail of what we do. Um, and obviously I come from the School of Education, so I'm teaching future teachers. Um, and uh, I'm gonna read this section. I created an open pedagogy project to help students find their way through teaching in K-12 settings. Open pedagogy is about helping students at the university uh, level take control of their learning while continuing to meet the objectives laid out by the course syllabus. Um, an open pedagogy project is an excellent example of putting trust in your students and allowing them to take risks. And I'll talk a little bit about those risks in a few minutes. But uh, this project was the first step in trusting my students to learn. The work requires hard work and trust and allowing students to validate their own learning. So I see open pedagogy as an instrument for students to think about what they value. They might hate your course, they might not like mathematics, but there's something in your course that they will value through open pedagogy and maybe take to that next place. Um, and I wanted to mention too that I was a, um, an accessibility fellow. We're working on accessibility practices on our campus and some of what I asked students to do was around making their, um, their documents that they send to me uh, through Google or um, other platforms accessible. And most of what I did was about structured content. And if you're not clear about that, um, every campus is required to ensure that their web pages and their materials, the things that you hand out, um, the things that are online are accessible. And when you think about open pedagogy, you're making everything you do in that class open, not just to the, the professor, but also to every student within that classroom. And accessibility is sort of a spin on that. Um, and I, I want to remind you too, that this past semester that I did a teaching and learning and diverse classroom MOOC. And that MOOC um, was through um, um, Cor um, Cornell. So I, I'm sharing a link to it, teaching and learning in a diverse classroom, because uh, that MOOC obviously gives you an opportunity to look at what you're doing in terms of retaining all students in the classroom. And it does, again, bring you back to accessibility and working with diverse populations. And what we're doing around open pedagogy is really about including all students in, in what we do. Um, so I'm highly recommending that. I did that last, um, uh, I did that last fall and it really did also connect to the open pedagogy. Um, I've already talked a little bit about access to students, but I wanna give you two examples. Um, my students taught me about Zelly and Venmo. And hopefully you might not be connected to Zelly and Venmo, but um, I was sort of anti that whole banking thing online. My students, my young students taught me about it. They're digital natives. They have different ways of doing things. And so we have to integrate some of their different ways of approaching their learning, whether it's with technology or with banking. And so I want to teach my students not to be afraid of things. And they've taught me about Venmo and Zelly. Um, if you want to ask me more about that, you can email me and I'll tell you um, about that. So students have choice. They don't have to be at your institution. They don't even have to be in your class. They've got lots of options. And when you read their college essays, um, a thousand years ago, I did admissions, so I got to read college essays. You realize they're coming with the, these amazing ideas about where they're going to be three, four, five, ten years from now. And you want to think about that when they enter your class, whether they're a junior or a freshman. And our role really, from my perspective, is to facilitate their learning and the connections that they want to make in their lives. Um, 
the, uh, a long time ago, back in 2011, um, uh, Weinberger um, talked about who's the smartest person in the room, and the room is the smartest person, um, meaning the interactions and the human beings in that room have access to the knowledge that's going to make them smarter to help them move forward. And I, I wanted to um, connect you to that book because it does make you rethink who has the knowledge base. Is it the textbook? Is it the professor? And I'm saying you create the structure and the students um, create the learning that they want to build from that. Um, this is Marcia, could I stop you there for a question? Yeah. Yes. I think while it's relevant there. Um, we have a question from Scott uh, asking to hear a little bit more about students contributing documents and videos that are accessible and just wondering are the students adept at doing that with the accessibility? Yeah, um, as part of being an accessibility fellow, there was one person from each of the schools, uh, School of Ed, School of Business, etc. And my approach to building accessibility across the institution was to require my students to hand in assignments that were accessible. So what that meant is um, I asked students to use Google Docs and there's a software program called Grackle where they can go and test the accessibility of that document and then when they submit it, it's already accessible. And so I made that a requirement and it was easier than I thought it was going to be. I did spend some time in the beginning of the class um, ensuring that students knew what I was asking for and I made it a requirement without points. So if they handed something in, it had to be accessible. Again, these are going to be K-12 teachers and entering school districts, they're supposed to be thinking about universal design and making things accessible for all and not just accessible for students who might have a learning disability. So yes, my students handed in electronically their assignments using Google Docs or Word, and then running it through the accessibility checkers. Um, and I'm happy to take some more questions about that. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the examples of open pedagogy. And there are three. The most important one is the one I did last semester that opened my eyes to um, accessibility. I agreed to um, open my eyes to open pedagogy. Um, I agreed to try some open pedagogy things in my classroom and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I thought that in my junior level educational foundations course would be the best place to get that started. Um, the students were told on day one, you're gonna be creating a textbook. I didn't know what that meant. I wasn't sure what platform that was going to happen in. I just said, tell them they're gonna create a textbook. And as you get to the parts where they're gonna to need to actually do it, you will have worked out those details. And uh, John Kane in economics, Dr. John Kane in economics, had done that the previous semester and talked about uh, the challenges around getting students ready to produce something that would be open to the world. Meaning, as I said before, it's not just for the professor, it's not just for their classmates, it's for people outside of the class. And um, so I told students in the beginning that they'd be doing this and they seemed excited. I heard little rumors during the semester about, oh, we're gonna be writing a textbook. Meanwhile, I had no clue about what that was going to look like. So around mid semester, I uh, put students into teams and I, um, showed them again the course objectives and I said you're going to be placed in a team around the course objectives and they had been doing readings and writing reaction papers and um, writing annotated bibliographies. This is an, um, an undergraduate class and it's around topics in education whether it's the history of education or teaching for social justice or what does it mean to be in music education and what is the history so they had been doing these readings and I allowed them to select some of their own readings in addition to the readings that I had available to them. And um, they ended up 
um, you know, uh, meeting collaboratively and thinking about how they wanted to organize their materials. And then I threw a little glitch in there and I said, it can't just be text. It's got to include links and it's got to include some visuals and um, it has to be an accessible document. And um, we uh, used things from Creative Commons license. So students learned a little bit about Creative Commons and, and you know, how that, uh, um, how, how those labels would make it accessible to others to redo and rethink and pull from to make their own. And so by the end of the semester, they were able to create this uh, textbook. It's out there. It's on Pressbooks. Um, and um, there's an introduction that I created. And I will say again, it's not perfect. Um, and you can go to that link later on. I'll put, you can um, have access to that link to see what, what's there. Um, when you go to the book, I provide a small introduction to give perspective because I don't want people to look at the book and say, well, you know, this is not a masterpiece. It's not meant to be a masterpiece. It's meant to be a product that's accessible, created by students. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's meant to, you can see some of the topics, the meaning of school, um, meaning making in education, the history of schooling. And so students were given a, um, as I said, an objective, and then they created these chapters. And the groups were uh, typically groups of um, two or three students, and they decided how they were going to organize that material. Um, this was probably the most frightening thing that I did all semester because I had that idea in my head that this book is going to um, show products that are not perfect, and so would people evaluate me based on this, this, um, this exercise of getting students to realize that their voice meant something. But in the end, I realized that the process of writing the book and posting it and getting students to, you know, have a voice in their own education, really the process and the product kind of go together. Um, and I'm happy to have you take a look at it and ask questions. Um, you know, read my introduction. Um, and I'm feeling uncomfortable about it, but I'm really proud of the work because students, um, I think, work harder when they know that it's not going to be um, at the end of the semester, it's over. They can go back to this product. They can take a look at their work. Three years from now, they can go back and um, think about where they were developmentally and where they um, where they will move on. So the open pedagogy project that I did was to produce a textbook. It was structured in a way that they did readings across the semester, but then they selected the references and how they would put together a chapter that connected to the objectives of the course. So that was my first foray. Um, my second foray was through a course where um, it's a global learning course, but it's an education course where we go to Benin, West Africa. And the way the course is organized is we do the, the teaching part of the course in the fall, and then we travel in January and we go to Benin for about 19 days. I just came back from Benin um, uh, late January. And um, all of the assignments are done in Google excuse me, so that's another point that I want to make is the students post to Google and I am the owner of that assignment and everyone in class can see everybody else's assignment. They can see the work that their peers are doing all the way through the semester. They can, I call, steal ideas from their peers and realize that their peers are doing better than they are or realize that their writing might not be up, up to par and they end up really working harder on the ongoing assignments than they do if it wasn't open to everyone. I'm going to mention the reaction papers that students did. They do seven in a seven week course in preparation for the 19 day travel. And I organized the, the 
uh, papers under these categories of cognitive, affective, and cognitive. And that is significant only because they're reading three or four research articles and then they're writing, what did I learn? What, what were the articles about? Really, it's a little bit of regurgitation. Then the affective section of the paper is, what does it mean? Um, do I agree? Do I disagree? How does that connect with my conceptual framework about those readings? And the readings are about um, colonialism and um, schools in Africa and global education and um, how we're taught in the US. And then the last section, the cognitive section is how does what I've learned in these readings, how am I going to use that information in my future? They're not all education majors. There's some business, communication, and this cognitive, affective, cognitive place um, uh, structure helps students realize that when you read something, it's connected to something that you already know. And now I want you to think about what your next steps might be with that information. So. Um, I mentioned that structure because when they're traveling in Benin, they're taking pictures and they're taking videos. Um, and I decided at the end that students would produce some sort of digital project. Um, maybe I decided that in the syllabus, and again, I wasn't sure what it was going to, um, I wasn't sure what it was going to look like. But in the end, I asked students to write a three to five page three to five page paper to represent their experience and their travel, but also to think about all the things they had read as part of their travel, and then to do a, um, a digital piece. And so each of the nine students, when they returned, um, put together some sort of digital presentation. And um, this digital presentation is, available online. Um, if I share this now, it's outside of the class, but it's also within the class. So students got to see um, each other's work. And now if I click on one of the videos, I, I guess I should have rehearsed which one I wanted to share with you. Um, I guess I'll do Kayla Meadows. I don't know if that's going to work. But um, I want to share the video with you only because this is a freshman who, um, I don't know if it's going to, it's going to, I'm going to share that with you. So Marcia, we can hear it, but we can't see it because it's only sharing your doc, not the okay. video. Very but good. I can well, put the link in the chat for people. Okay. Yeah. So we'll go out of there. Thank you. Thank you. So um, what I will say about these products is when I read their papers, I understood the, their intellectual contribution, but when you see the videos that are public and they're open, you see the emotional connection and you begin to understand how students connect to the, the cognitive and the cognitive. What am I going to do with the information I learned? And if they had just produced it for myself, for me, I'm sure it would show their learning, but when they have to produce it maybe for their parents or for a wider audience, they speak to things that are relevant to education in general. And so um, if you have a chance to look at these videos, I will say Adobe Spark um, page and video are not accessible. And in the future, I would spend some time in class helping students um, make the videos and the pictures more accessible. So that's a glitch in the system. Um, but again, I'm showing you a second example of um, open pedagogy in that it's a travel course, it's different from a foundations, it's an elective, um, it's connected to travel and then on our campus we have something called digital oz that lee wilson runs so those vis those videos that students produce will be available um, to the suny oswego public or to anyone that goes to those websites so again that's the second example and then my last example um, is my childhood uh, math methods course that i'm teaching currently um, it's a hybrid course 
and um, students are um, going to be elementary school teachers, grades one through six. Um, and they're in their second education course. They're going to teach actually in K um, six environments. Um, they are still using Google Drive. Um, there's a link to Google Drive from Blackboard and all of their assignments are posted there. Again, everyone in class can see everyone's postings at all times. I'm the owner, but they're posting their assignments and students even in the middle of the week before the assignment is due, can go in and see what um, their peers are posting. And um, I think, again, it makes collaboration a little bit easier. So it's not really about Google Docs. It's about students who are sharing their work um, in the beginning, the middle, and the end. So sometimes what I do is, um, I'll go in in the beginning of the week to see what students are doing with a particular lesson plan. And as they're in that system, I'll make comments as they're working on the assignment. So they don't have to wait until the assignment is, is um, posted to get feedback. They get feedback on an ongoing basis. Again, that's in Google, it's in Docs, I own the files, and by um, owning the files at any point I can get in and you know pull it down or share it elsewhere but students know when they walk into class that they're part of an open pedagogy and that their work is at all times going to be shown. Um, I'm gonna um, step back a little bit and tell you about one student last semester in my foundations course, um, the very first education course, I had one student object to having his work posted for everyone. And um, he said, well, I don't want people to see what I'm doing. And I say, it's part of, I said, it's part of the learning process for you to be vulnerable enough to share your work so that you can get feedback, not just from me, but also from your peers. And um, I'm not saying I'm good at uh, explaining that. I'm just saying to my teacher, future teachers, that we're in this together. Um, you know, that reinforcement of the smartest person in the room, that the room really needs to trust one another through the learning process. And open pedagogy really does reinforce um, some of those tenets the tenants that are, you know, that collaboration sharing and the connected communication and um, collectively growing in knowledge through the resources. So it was a little bit hard because I didn't, I was afraid that the student might push back further. Um, the student didn't push back any further, but it is a really different way of looking at the work that students produce and um, who's responsible for assessing it, not evaluating it, but who's responsible for assessing it. And my approach right now is that um, students are all um, assessing one another's work and I use that information in my evaluation, but I'm doing the evaluation and the grades are not shared. So the grades are posted separately. I provide feedback. Um, maybe that's called formative feedback, but I'm not sure in the grade that the student earned a C. And there's kind of a problem with that because students might look at my comments and know that it's a negative comment, but not really know that someone earned, a, you know, a grade that might not be acceptable. So I don't know if anybody has any feedback on that. Um, it's 10 So Marcia, there is, a, there is a comment about that. So just to piggyback off of what you're saying, I think many of us do see students come with that mindset. And uh, the comment in the chat is um, that Scott is finding students are inhibited by submitting work that's imperfect, right? They're still focused on the product and not the process. Um, and he struggles to impress this upon them. And how, this is how it works in the real world. Yeah, and you know, my real world has only ever been in education. So I, I will say that in schools, um, we're still not there. And convincing students that um, being vulnerable is a part of trusting and you're going to learn more if you can make yourself a little more vulnerable, 
Um, and it, it is true that that's the way it works in the real world when you put out a paper and someone evaluates it and says, no, it's not up to snuff and you've got to make all these changes or no, you know, find a different journal that connects with who we are. Um, I, I, I think that we have to be, um, I think it's our responsibility to help students see that in another way. And I'm not saying it's not difficult. I'm just saying that open pedagogy kind of reinforces how difficult it is, but that it's something that's going to um, move them along that learning continuum. And, and I, I do think that if students aren't trusting their peers and they're not trusting you, then their, their learning may or may not be stifled. Um, so in conclusion, um, I'm trusting students to produce products connected to their aspirations. And um, they came to the institution with ideas about what that, that institution is going to do for them and how they're going to get an education. And I'm creating structure that um, allows them to trust their peers and trust me. Um, so with a little bit of risk, there's going to be a little more reward. And in math education, there's something called productive struggle, that you have to be willing to kind of make a mistake and work through that mistake. And I see open pedagogy kind of in the same way. Um, I love problem solving in mathematics. I don't think I'm very good at it, but I enjoy that whole process. Not every student enjoys that process, but we have to get them to a place where if they're going to be teachers or they're going to be in the world, that they have to be sort of open to struggling and that there's some reward around that. Um, students really do want to do what we ask of them, but we have to create projects that they want to do. And I put that in there to say that I'm not great at always creating the best product that they love, but I create enough structure so that, um, you know, if students need that traditional, well, how am I going to be graded? And, you know, what does, what is my peers, um, um, opinion of my work? How is that going to affect the grade? I reinforce that we're in this together. We're working together. And maybe they believe me, but maybe they don't. But I will um, remind us too, there's a, an article on um, equitable teaching practices. And it's really about, um, it's from a biologist. But I mention it because there's a nice summary that an open pedagogy does create a space for you to work with small groups. And, give students opportunities to do a lot of writing and time to write and they write and they get feedback in the process and not when the grade is there but earlier um, and then um, giving students opportunities to think and talk the Benin project with their their um, Adobe videos that are out in the world. The textbook product project is also an opportunity for an opportunity for students to think and talk about who they are around the content. And um, point number D: encouraging, demanding, and actively managing the participation of all students. It does feel like more work to be in the Google you know, in the beginning of the week, in the middle of the week, and then when I see them, especially in a hybrid class, I have a sense of where they are, and it does change what I'm going to do for the next class. But um, I, I do think that um, this whole idea of open pedagogy does help students to um, cultivate divergent thinking. And um, once they get used to the fact that everyone's going to see their work, they do relax by mid-semester about putting something out there that might not be um, perfect. I really appreciate you coming this morning and listening to me. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. These are some um, sources that I, I mentioned. This Haggerty article from 2015 is um, a good one because it breaks down open pedagogy and open pedagogy practices in a really good way. And I really have to think back to 1970 um, when I learned about Carl Rogers. You decide what you want to learn and what you're going to get out of it. And so my cognitive, affective, and cognitive piece really comes from 
if we're asking you to do some reading and we're asking you to think about things, how are you going to use that information? And sometimes you have to push them a little bit to get to that space. Um, I was concerned about um, going too short, but I'm open to answering any questions right now at 10.05. Great, thank you, Marcia. There was another comment, um, just in agreement with you about students creating projects on what they want to do. Um, and Trudy has her students create content for Wikipedia, which involves a steep learning curve, but many have said they're willing to do this learning because they were able to pick the article or topic that they worked on. So. I appreciate Trudy's contribution. If anyone would like to um, unmute yourselves, you're welcome to um, use your microphone to ask questions or feel free to type anything in the chat. Yeah, you know, and I wanna echo that, like in the beginning of the semester with my first open pedagogy project, I remember saying, oh my goodness, I don't think they're gonna be ready for this book. What is it gonna look like? But that's kind of the trust piece. Like you're trying to trust the process. Like you say it, that you trust that they're gonna get to where you want them to go. But throughout the semester, I was completely afraid of um, what they were going to produce and if it would be a reflection on me. It's always a reflection on me, but it's not about me. And so as I think about why I continue to do this, um, I realize that for me, it's about them realizing the power in themselves to learn what they need to learn. Even if something is challenging, it is within them to figure it out. Again, I'm going to go back to the structure. I provide the structure and the monitoring. And in K-12 education, we talk about monitor and adjust. And you do end up doing more adjusting in the semester than you, um, you might if you weren't doing an open pedagogy project because you're learning from the students throughout the semester and you might change what you do during that next class because of something that was written during the week that you had access to. Great, are there any other questions or comments? I would like to thank you very much, uh, Marcia, for sharing with us today. As I put in the chat, today's session was recorded and we will upload that recording to the website uh, by the end of the week. I've posted that in the chat. It's just a quick little bit.ly SUNY OEW 2020. We do have more webinars throughout the day today and throughout the week. So on that site, you can explore other activities that are happening. And we do encourage you to take a look at things happening around the globe on the Open Education website as well. We hope to see you all at another virtual event soon. Thank you so much for tuning in and thank you to Dr. Burrell for all of your um, insight and your experience. All right, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Marcia.